It's great being with you. This no. Uh, this is actually not my first time to be with you. Uh, I was here once before, uh, the Sunday before Sarah, formerly Hooten, now Hull, and Drew were married. Uh, I was able to be with you. My wife and I were both here uh, that Lord's Day morning, and then we were privileged uh, to be part of that wedding. I don't know that I know any of you other than uh, Don and Tracy, and if we have met before, my apologies for, for having uh, forgotten that. Uh, please forgive me. I'll probably be asking for forgiveness quite often uh, for various things. Uh, but I'm thrilled to be with you now. Now, a few weeks ago, my wife told me, Don's asking me for stories about you. And she even told me this yesterday. She says, Don keeps asking for stories about you. I don't know what you're walking into. So I'll happily answer any questions you have about the things that he brought up. I'll also put him on the back foot as well. Ask Don tonight why he doesn't have more kids. And I know the answer to that one because he gave it in a sermon whenever he preached once in Tampa. So please, just go ahead and ask him about that. Uh, that'd be much better than the stories I have to tell. It is great being with you. Uh, and we are going to be looking in the book of Ephesians tonight and, and really throughout, throughout the, the weekend. Now, we're not starting there though. And I'll tell you how, how I came to this and why we're, we're even focusing on this because that's something I'm, I'm kind of working on with our group in Tampa as well. So every year we, we plan, as you do here, I know your elders and your deacons work on, on various plans for the year. And, and not every year, but a lot of years we'll say, well, we want to focus on this theme. Okay? We want to we have some lessons devoted to a theme. And I'll be honest, in, in the fall of last year when it kind of came time for that, my brain was mush. I, I, I wasn't thinking of anything. So one of our elders just said, Let's just kind of keep it basic. Let's use Philippians 4.20, and that'll be the theme. And all Philippians 4.20 says is, to our God and Father be glory forever. That means something. One, it means God is glorious. And of course, the Scriptures testify to that throughout. They describe God as glorious. And of course, the second part of that is, well, we have a responsibility to give Him glory, whatever that means. But glory is also kind of one of those terms that, well, you kind of know what it is based on the attributes that are described as glory. So we may think of, of various things about God, and we're going to talk about some of those things tonight. We'll say, well, God is glorious because of that. But what do we mean by glory itself? And as I was thinking about that, another word kind of came to mind that I think helps us understand what the Scriptures are saying when it talks about giving God glory or talking about His glory. And that is the word reputation. I grew up in a very small town. One traffic light kind of town. It was called Corner, Alabama, and it was in the corner of a county. That's the only reason it got the name Corner. Okay? If you were ever driving north out of Birmingham on I-65, there's an exit called Hayden Corner. Two towns. You go one way to get Hayden, you go the other way to get to Corner. And again, if you go through the one traffic light, you've gone through Corner. That's all there was. So to say that, growing up as a sports-loving kid, I didn't get to watch a lot of sports. We had rabbit ears, so we got the local ABC channel, we got the local CBS channel, we got the local Fox channel, local NBC channel, and PBS. That's what we got at our house. Most people I knew and went to school with, they didn't have cable. Cable didn't come down most of the roads where I lived. So growing up in, say I'm about the age of my youngest son. My youngest son's 11. So, say in 1988, when I was 10, I would have, you know, that, I would have been 10 in 1988, 11 in 1989. Well, there was a lot of incredible things going on in sports. And in my small town, Alabama, of course, you start hearing about various characters, various figures, and you hear about Michael Jordan. 
everybody knows who Michael Jordan is. Well, we knew who Michael Jordan was, but I hardly ever got to see him play. I, I just didn't watch much basketball, and we didn't get a lot of games, and it didn't have Sports Center. I couldn't go and watch the highlights. It's very different now. You know, anything that happens in the world now, your kid and their friends, they can look on their phone and go to YouTube and say, Did you see that? Well, not when I was a kid. I mean, somebody might come to school and say, Did you hear about what Michael Jordan did last night? No, what? He took off from the free throw line and dunked the basketball. He jumped over a seven-foot guy and he dunked the basketball. And I never saw it. He just heard these things. Well, again, I'm about 10 years old. And my best friend in school, his mom worked for the University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB. So because of that, over the summer, we would just go to camps. UAB had a baseball camp. We'd go to UAB baseball camp. His mom would take us, drop us off, pick us up at the end of the day, take us home. UAB had a basketball camp. We'd go to basketball camp. I didn't play much basketball, but hey, why not? Let's, let's go to UAB basketball camp. Well, the coach of UAB at the time was a man named Gene Bartow. Probably not known to most of you. His claim to fame, other than being the UAB coach, was he followed the most successful coach ever at UCLA, John Wooden. It didn't last that long because he's following the legend. Well, somehow, he and Michael Jordan were friends. One morning at basketball camp, we started hearing, Michael Jordan's coming to Birmingham. Like, what? And sure enough, I don't know if he'd come in and was playing golf with with Coach Bartow or what, but that night, they had a one-man exhibition of Michael Jordan in the UAB basketball arena. And if you went to camp, you got in for free. Again, I had never really seen Michael Jordan play. I'd heard about Michael Jordan. And thought, Michael Jordan's going to that night, I saw a man fly. He lived up to the reputation. I understand most of you know me only by reputation. And that's probably not a very good one. But you know what you know based on reputation. Maybe Don or Tracy has said some things and said, well, we'll give this guy a try and so you came out tonight. When we think of giving God glory and God's glory in the Bible, maybe it would help us to think of that. What is the Bible saying is God's reputation? And then what does it mean for us to burnish that reputation to those around us? That's kind of what we're focusing on this weekend. So again, get your Bibles. What we're doing tonight is we are looking at three aspects of God that declare Him to be glorious. He is glorious because of these, these, thing, these three things. That's what He is known for. That's His reputation, if you will. So tonight we're doing a little bit of an overview, if you will, of, of some of the things in Ephesians. Tomorrow night and Sunday we'll get a little bit more narrowed in and looking at some specifics. But turn to chapter 1, and we're going to pick up in verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory... Just think of that. Here Paul in saying, I'm praying for you and I want you to come to understand some things, but I'm praying that the Father of glory... What about God is so wondrous that He can be described as the Father of glory? That the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might. Now let's just pause there. 
Putting this in a nutshell, what Paul is saying is, I want you, I'm praying to God that you, my brethren, come to understand three things. I want you to know the hope of your calling. I want you to know what are the riches of His inheritance. Now tomorrow night, we're going to start back in verse 3 of chapter 1. And we're going to work our way up through verse 14. Those things that we're going to talk about tomorrow night, that's the hope, that's the inheritance. And those two things kind of seem to fit. Hope and inheritance go along. That's what we're hoping for. We're hoping for the inheritance, right? But then what's the third thing that Paul says? This is too what I'm wishing, or praying rather, that you would come to understand. I want you to understand what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might. And so while on the surface, power may not seem to fit with the general idea of, okay, hope and inheritance, but in actuality, it makes all the sense in the world. Because the only reason there's any hope, the only reason there's any inheritance, is because of the power that God possesses. Throughout the Scriptures, God is lauded. He is magnified. He is glorified because of His power. And that power has importance. All the promises that He has ever made rely on the fact that He is powerful enough to bring them to pass. And that's exactly what Paul goes on to talk about here and in chapter 2. So he takes up in verse 20. That He, so he's talking about the power of God, the power that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The only reason, again, we have hope and inheritance is because the Messiah who came into the world and gave His life as a sacrifice for us and then was crucified by the very people that He came to save did not remain in the grave. God's power not only raised Him from the dead, but then exalted Him to His very right hand. And God then placed everything under His feet. Again, tomorrow night when we look at verses 3 through 14, we're going to see the significance of that too, because guess what? We who have come to God, where are we found? We're in Christ. We are now with the one. Even though we may not think of it this way, we may not see it this way. We are with Christ who is at the very right hand of God. We are with Christ, who is exalted over all things. We have hope. We have inheritance because of what God's power has done. And then we come to chapter 2. Paul makes the power of God personal. God's power raised His Son. God's power exalted His Son. God's power does the very same thing for you and I. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom... We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You're familiar with those verses. It's saying a death occurred. Each and every one of us, a death has already occurred in our lives. We were dead because of our actions and our choices. We followed after the prince of the power of the air. We were like the rest of the world. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The, ver- the word we probably focus on in verse 4 is love. Love is why God raised us. God, I'm sorry, love is why God made us alive. But love is not how. I doubt I'm the only person in the room. In fact, I know I'm not. Who has been in the room when a death has occurred. Chances are, you, like me, have been in the room when someone you loved very much died. And if love was the only thing needed to bring them back to life, they would have been brought back to life right then and there. It wasn't a matter, did you love them? No, you didn't have the power to bring them back to life. Paul is saying, yes, the reason why we're brought back to life, the reason why we're given life in Christ, the reason why we're now raised up and seated with Christ is because God loves us, but it's by His power. Three things I want you to understand, Paul says. I'm praying you understand these things. I want you to know your hope. I want you to know the riches of His inheritance. And I want you to know the power of God. He is the Father of glory because of the power that He has. The next Scripture tonight is in Ephesians 3. And in Ephesians 3, we find Paul's second prayer that he offers for these brethren in Ephesus. And so we're going to go ahead and read verses 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's certainly some things about this passage that I'm going to leave for Sunday because I want to talk about them then. But just as in Paul's first prayer in chapter 1, Paul is wanting his brethren to come to understand or comprehend something. So in chapter 1, it was their hope their inheritance, and the power of God that makes those things possible. But in this prayer, it is love. And interestingly, and again, we'll talk about this more on Sunday, Paul says, I want you to understand the dimensions of that love. Something that truly isn't possible for you to comprehend, yet Paul says, I want you to comprehend this. And I think it's that dimensional aspect that maybe we don't comprehend too well. So if we go back again to chapter 2, we already saw this. We read chapter 2 really on an individual basis. We think, okay, when it talks about in chapter 2, you were dead. Okay, that's talking about me. I, Joshua Creel, was dead. You, Don Hooten, were dead. You, state your name, you were dead. And while that is true, and is not wrong to read that personally, if Paul were writing this in the language of Alabama, he would actually say, y'all were dead. Y'all were dead. It's plural. You were all dead. And because of God and His love, He brought you to life. Paul is looking at the totality of the brethren. 
And he amplifies that later in chapter 2 when addressing the Gentiles specifically and talks about how they were alienated. They were strangers of the covenants. They were strangers and foreigners to the promises of God. But now, because of what God has done in Christ, He has brought them to Him. But again, that's not talking to one individual. It's not saying, Josh, you were alienated. You were strangers and He brought you to. No, all of you, Paul is saying, God has brought now to Him. And really, so many of Paul's epistles and things that he writes has that idea in the background. That Paul was looking to bring harmony between Jew and Gentile Christians to say you were all in the same boat, but now in Christ, thank God, you are in His family. You're in His boat. He has made that possible. He has brought you all together. And so when Paul talks about the household of God later in chapter 2, and he talks about how they're being built up as a temple of God, he's making that point. It's all of you. Regardless of what background you're from, regardless of how it was that you sinned and died, regardless of what temptations you're prone to, God is now making His temple of all of you. And Paul will just continue that line of thinking in chapter 3. Perhaps the the passage that summarizes it the best is verse 6. When Paul is talking about how he wants them to understand the mystery and how they can understand the mystery. And he says, here's what the mystery is. What is a mystery? Again, going back to my, my youth, we didn't have many channels. So, summertime, you'd go outside and play in the morning, but it'd get hot by noon, so you'd go inside. And I remember what was always on the local Fox affiliate. They would have Lucille Ball, followed by the Andy Griffith Show, followed by Perry Mason. I watched a lot of Perry Mason as a kid. Same exact setup. Every single episode. Someone dies in the beginning, I mean. And it's a mystery. You don't know who did it. But by the end, Perry Mason has gotten somebody to confess on the witness saying they did it. Mystery solved. The mystery that Paul's talking about is the one that God started revealing in shadow, if you will, from the very beginning. That is, how is God going to redeem all of mankind to Himself? Not one family, not one descendant, But how is God going to redeem all of man to Himself? That's what Paul says in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the Gospel. And that's the essence of what Paul is trying to get them to understand in his second prayer in chapter 3. He says, I want you to comprehend the dimensions of God's love. And what he's saying is that love is much greater than you can possibly fathom. I think of the people in my life that I truly love. I think of my family. I think of my my brethren at university. I think of friends that I've met along the way. I think of brethren that I've met in various places. But I can also think of so many people in this world that I I don't hate them, but I don't necessarily feel love toward them. I, I don't go out of my way to do things for them. And in fact, when I hear about things that they may do, I just kind of roll my eyes and try to ignore it. What Paul is saying is, God loves them all. Now, they're not all part of His family. But God's love is that great. That whoever would come to Him in Christ, they can be part of His family. That's a love I don't fully comprehend. I know it's there and I am thankful for it. I am thankful that each and every one of us, God could love us. His love is that great that it could bring us into His family. And our final passage tonight from Ephesians is probably the best known passage out of all of Ephesians, and that's in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 
And we're going to start in verse 10. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Final aspect of God that we want to think about and glorify and praise tonight is His faithfulness. Faithfulness is not mentioned necessarily in that passage, but it permeates that passage. Because here we are as men and women, now sons and daughters of God, who have been made His children because of His great power and because of His wondrous love. And yet we still live with all these temptations, with all these struggles, and we wonder, how are we going to make it to the end? How are we going to still be found faithful in Christ in the end? Well, Paul is certainly not letting us off the hook. You can't read chapters 4 through 6 and think, okay, we just sit back and everything. No, no, not at all. What Paul is saying is, your God, the one who has power and the one who loves you, is greater than your enemy. He, if you are with Him, He will be by your side. He is going to be the one who defeats Him. Certainly, He doesn't mince words. He doesn't act as if the situation isn't dire. No, He says, no, the, the enemy's real. And the enemy's powerful. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. But the very first thing that Paul had said in this is that we should be strong, not in our own power, not in our own might, but rather be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And then of course we know the the well-known verses about what armor we're to put on, but the point he's making is this is God's armor. He's the one that provides it. And so even though we're putting it on, it is still God who is fighting the evil one. We're merely putting on the protection that He gives us. And of course, most significant of all, of all of the pieces of armor that He enumerates, is what He says in verse 16 when He says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Paul saying, as you are putting on all this armor, don't forget, it all comes back to your faith in your God. Is your God strong enough? Does your God love you enough? Is your God going to do what He said? And the answer is always yes. Throughout Scripture, whether it's being urged to hold fast to our confession in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, or whether we are being urged to confess our sins when we sin, the New Testament writers bring it back to God's faithfulness. We are urged to hold fast to our confession. Why? Because He who promised is faithful. Don't give up, the Hebrew writer is saying. Don't let the world get you down. No, you stay true to your confession. Because your God, whom you are confessing, He is going to be faithful to you. 
John says in 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9, that we're not to act as if we have no sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Rather, confess. And what does he say? What is God? He is righteous and He is just to cleanse you of all your sins. Those are covenant terms. God, since He promised to forgive us, what John is saying is, you confess to God. Why? Because you have the assurance He is going to be faithful to what He said He would do. He is going to be righteous and He is going to be just. He is going to cleanse you yet again. He will forgive you yet again. That is the God we serve. We serve a God who is faithful. In a world that's faithless, in our own lives, we have experienced too many times where people have been faithless with us or we have been faithless ourselves. We serve a God who is absolutely faithful. We began tonight by briefly noting Paul's description of God in chapter 1 and verse 17. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. And we have been emphasizing glory and what Ephesians tells us about the glory of God. His power, His love, His faithfulness. That's the reputation of our God. And that's what we have experienced if you are in Christ. And why is that? Well, we didn't talk about the first part of that description. It's Father of glory. What Ephesians is talking about is how all of us can have God as our Father. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow night, but here is why that is possible. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Why is He the Father of glory? Well, the first thing Paul says in that passage is that He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right then and there, that tells you He is truly the Father of glory. But then what he goes on to talk about is how God is our Father too. Because He adopted us. He made us His children. But that adoption came at a price. It came at the the price of the blood of His Son. The invitation, the simple invitation that we offer tonight is that you can have God as your Father. The God of power the God of love, the God of faithfulness. He can be your Father. And that is because of what He has done in Christ. The blood that Christ shed for us. And that you can have forgive you of your sins if you will do what Christ Himself asks you to do. Believe in Him. Be baptized to be forgiven of your sins. I praise you with all